Coming to you live from the fabulous Mediaplex in downtown Windsor, this is a St. Clair College journalism presentation. Hi, I'm Jolene Bulmer, and you're watching Mediaplex News Now. Unit 7 is an organization that assists the homeless. Reporter Aaron Kirsty tells us the story of two women who turned there for help. Please be advised that some of this material is graphic in nature. For most people, a walk through the park is a way to relax or get some exercise. For Christine Wilson, it is a painful reminder of the many sleepless nights she spent there as a homeless teenager. It was very brutal. I quickly lost track of how many men raped me. Born in London, Ontario, Wilson spent her early childhood years in a series of what she calls bizarre foster homes, until she was adopted at the age of 11. But her happiness quickly turned to horror. I was bullied by her and the children. Uh, she knew what her husband was doing to me. In fact, when he finally successfully raped me, she helped hold me down while he did it. Wilson says the incident forced her to make a difficult decision one that resulted in her living on the streets until she was 18. I couldn't be there any longer, and I, I really made the conscious choice. I'd rather be raped by strangers and wake up one more day in that house and be around them, call them mom and dad, are you kidding? They were freakish animals to me. They weren't human. Wilson says despair finally led her to what she believes was the right place. He said he had a message and he said, uh, that he just wanted to tell me that uh, I was going through everything I'd gone through because one day I'd be helping people who would then be going through what I was going through now. Now an administrator for Street Help, a local homeless shelter, Wilson says her unique experience has helped set her facility apart from other local shelters. It's a self-help component in here that makes it work. Each time you've come in, the people behind the bars preparing the food, serving the food, or reheating the food. They're the people that use the program. Crystal is 29 years old and has been living on the streets on and off since she was 12. She says Wilson has helped her through some tough times. I was living in a park with my ex. I left when I first got about in at seven. And I came in here and I was so scared because there were so many people that I didn't know. But then I started coming every day, talk, mingling with the people and talking to them. And Sarah Lewis discovered Street Help five years ago. She says hearing stories like Weir's inspired her to start a fundraising campaign. Though her efforts have earned her national attention and several awards, she says she's not in it for the accolades. They may make you feel good, but really, when I win the awards, I want Street Help to have the awareness. And that awareness is what keeps Street Help open. Wilson says Lewis's annual Socks Warm Your Heart campaign has raised at least half of the $40,000 a year needed to run the agency, which currently feeds more than 120 people a day, and she doesn't see that number going down anytime soon. I think we should be working to find solutions to the problem, real solutions. I mean this wholeheartedly. The only service provider who's doing their job is someone who's trying to work themselves out of a job. Street Help is located at 964 Wyandotte Street East. They accept donations of food and clothing between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. daily. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Erin Christie. It's Organ and Tissue Donor Awareness Week. Windsor has one of the lowest rates in organ and tosion, of organ and tissue donation in Windsor. To combat this problem, Hotel Du Grace is showing a new documentary for Windsor and Essex County residents. Checking with our weather specialist, Chris Mayo, to see what the weather has in store for this week. Chris? Thanks, Jolene. Right now, we're experiencing some cloudy but warm weather. Tonight, we're expecting rain and temperature to be as low as 8. I'll be back a little bit later with the rest of this week's forecast. Back to you, Jolene. Thank you, Chris. Ariana Gendron tells us more about organic foods in this week's Health Minute. There's a lot of talk about organic food, but what's the real difference? According to LiciousLiving.com, the difference between organic and conventional food is just the way that it's grown. 
Conventional farmers apply chemical fertilizers to promote plant growth. They spray insecticides to reduce pests and disease. They use chemical herbicides to manage weeds. And they also give animals antibiotics, growth hormones, and medications to prevent disease and spur growth. To be labeled as organic, foods have to be composed of 95% organic content. Organic farmers apply natural fertilizers, such as manure or compost to feed soil and plants. They use beneficial insects and birds, mating disruption, or traps to reduce pests and disease. They rotate crops, till, handweed, or mulch to manage the weeds. They also give animals organic feed and allow them to access the outdoors. They use preventative measures such as rotating grazing, a balanced diet, and clean housing to help minimize disease. No conclusive evidence shows that organic food is more nutritious than conventionally grown food. In most cases, they look identical to each other. As for taste, some people report a difference, and some say that it tastes the same. I'm Rana Jean-Tenon, and this has been Your Health Minute. When it comes to music, many think nothing beats vinyl. And as Tom Morrison reports, record stores still have a role in our lives. Every year on the third Saturday in April, music lovers and artists celebrate a day for independent record stores across the world. And Dr. Disc Records has been a participant for the past six years. Many well-known artists put out special edition vinyl just for this day. And this had vinyl enthusiasts lined up at the cash register early in the morning. Liam O'Donnell, owner of Dr. Disc, says this day raises record store awareness. I think it's important to have Record Store Day because just to show interest in, in records again, to, to get people interested in buying vinyl again and, and just to support businesses. I mean, once record stores, if they're gone, they'll, they'll be missed for sure. So it's just nice to keep them alive. Record stores also tend to have special appearances and Dr. Des featured three acts from Windsor, including psychedelic electronic rock duo Learning. Guitarist Christopher Elkjar is also a vinyl collector. I, I love all the crazy releases that they're just invented for this day, which is such a cool idea to me. And uh, I, it's just an awesome way to let people know that this stuff is still happening and there are still independent stores. O'Donnell said this year's turnout was equivalent to last year's. The next record store day is April 19th, 2014. Reporting for Mediaplex News Now, I'm Tom Morrison. Our own Madison Jean sat down with Windsor Port Authority Harbour Master Peter Barry in this edition of 5 Minutes With. Hi, I'm Madison Jean, and today we're spending 5 Minutes With Windsor Port Authority Harbour Master Peter Barry. So, on the topic of low water levels in our local waterways, can you start us off by explaining uh, what causes these? There are several causes to the low water, and, and recently the most important cause that we had was last year we didn't get a lot of snow. Uh, we did get snow, we got a lot of rain coming through the spring, which helped us. Uh, brought the water levels up slightly at the end of last year into the spring of 2012. And then we had a beautiful summer. As much as we all want a beautiful summer, it's painful when it comes to the Great Lakes. We had a great deal of evaporation. And not only do we have the evaporation removing water, we also have areas of, of historical dredging like the St. Clair River where that water adjusts to the depth of that was dredged. And then now what happens is the water comes away from the shoreline. So what you might be seeing is more beach and a lot less water. Oh yeah, um, has this happened before and what's the normal water level? We've seen this historically through the 60s. We did see this in 1963-64 was the last hard marking of low water levels. And then back into previous to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s and 1920s. We have approached the historical lows of the 1920s. We've surpassed the lows of, of 1964. <laughs> Uh, each of the lakes has its own depth, has its own uh, water levels. Uh, what we're seeing is the water levels are down historically below the, the historical levels of three to four inches. Having said that, that also means that it's five, six feet below what it normally would be that you would remember on the Great Lakes or through Detroit River. Um, some people blame global warming for this. What do you think about that? Global warming is a component in, in, in very much so. The other components that we're looking at, of course, is water diversions that occur through Chicago and, and other parts of the Great Lakes. Increased water use as we now urbanize our shorelines and we come to a, a greater uh, tourism level of use, we're now taking more water from the lakes as well. There is, of course, the global warming component of less ice pack, uh, more sunlight, more evaporation, more heat. Uh, I hate to say it, but we need more snow. Yeah. We need more rain. 
We need more bad weather, but also uh, a thunderstorm incident where we get a heavy downpour. You think, well, that's great for the lakes. Mm -hmm. It's not, because what that does is causes the flow of the water to increase, and we actually lose more water in a thunderstorm incident. Um, you brought with you today the current level stats. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right now, our stats in, in, uh, for the Great Lake levels is running about 562 feet above sea level. That 562, we should be around the 567 level, so we are significantly down within historical levels. But now we're working in inches. Now where we are, we're going to see a couple of inches come back with the rain that we've seen. With the snow we saw this year, the ice pack is still in the upper Great Lakes. So there's still ice in some of the ports yeah. in the Great Lakes, despite chipping being open. So that helps, but now we're talking inches. The recovery of inches is as important because statistically we look at each inch of water means about 100,000 metric tons of cargo is left behind that we can't put onto ships because of the loss of that one inch. Um, what conditions need to be in place in order for the levels to rise? We need several things. We need cold winters, we need long winters, we need lots of snow, we need an ice pack. The ice does help slow down the melting, it doesn't stop it, but it does slow it down. We need a very slow spring so that the snow in the upper lakes, such as Huron and Superior and even Michigan, in the UP in Michigan, that snow and that runoff comes into the lake slowly. So the flow of the water is slow and that way we retain more water. We need a wet summer. Unfortunately, we're all craving that sunlight, but we need a wet summer. We need a lot of rain. Uh, it's going to take a long time to recover, but we also have to look at how we manage the lakes. There are two flood controls, two gates within the lakes that we can control that water level, but we do have to uh, look at how we manage that control in order to restore it. Um, so what would this mean for commercial trafficking? The commercial traffic, there are ports in the Great Lakes that commercial traffic right now is having a very hard to, time to get to, if not completely prohibited getting to it. Uh, as I said, each inch makes a difference. What's happening is we're having to light load a ship anywhere from 9 to 16 percent. And 9 to 16 percent on a 70,000 70, metric ton ship means we're almost at 65 to 55 metric tons rather than 70. So as we leave more on land, it costs you more. Okay, thanks for joining us, Peter. We just spent five minutes with Windsor Port Authority's Peter Berry. The Crime Stoppers team is in our studio with James Zimmerman to discuss how police investigations aid by social media. James? Thanks, Jolene. I'm here today with Constable Ryan Burney of the Windsor and Essex County Crime Stoppers. Ryan, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, James. Not a problem. Now, how is Crime Stoppers different from the Windsor Police Service? Well, Crime Stoppers is actually an arm's length of the police. It's run by a civilian board of directors, all volunteers, and, and they're, they run the program. Yeah, there's a police officer, myself, I'm with the OPP, I'm a police coordinator with Crime Stoppers. I have a partner, Tim Murphy, detective with Windsor Police, who also takes tips. And then there's a third party in our office, Ron Funkenhauser, who does all the fundraising and he's the events coordinator. Okay. Uh, now, how does social media help you connect with uh, Windsor and the surrounding community? I'm glad you asked me that question, James, because it's huge and new to us. Um, we started a Twitter page, we started a Facebook page, and we're slowly building our clientele. What we do at those pages is we, we take surveillance video, we take pictures of bad guys, and we also put out pictures of our, uh, our events. And, and we hope that people will look at those videos, check out those pictures, and maybe possibly recognize someone, give us a call, and we can put that tip in and pass the information on to the police and possibly help solve crime. Great, now uh, tell me about some of the accomplishments uh, that you've achieved uh, throughout the year with regards to social media. Well, we've had a, a couple success stories. Um, one being we had uh, some video that we had out um, that we put on Twitter and overnight we had 1600 hits on that. And the next morning we came in, we had numerous tips and unbelievably we're helped solve, police solve crime. So we take that tip information, pass it along police and hopefully solve that crime. Okay, very good. Uh, now, tell me a little bit about the long-term goals when it does come to uh, social media. There's a lot of avenues out there. And, and what is the, uh, what is Crime Stoppers' uh, plan on integrating all of those? Well, good question. And, and right now, we're starting with baby steps. We have our Twitter page. We have our Facebook page, like I said, where we post all those different events and, and video. 
but we also have a YouTube uh, videos videos as well where we put those videos. We get the surveillance video from, a, say, a Max convenience store. They get someone going in there and robbing that store. Now, with the technology we have, we can take that within hours, put it on our YouTube page, and send it out to hopefully hundreds of thousands of people to view those those videos, that surveillance video. And then again, at the end of the day, we ask people in our community to give us a call and to give us those that tip information. And remember, we allow all our tipsters to call us completely anonymous. They use the phone number. They can they can log on to our uh, our web page, and and give us tips anonymously. Okay, very good. Uh, now, what else should people know uh, about Crime Stoppers? What are some of the misconceptions uh, that people have about the program? Uh, I think the main misconception is that they're the police. If I call Crime Stoppers, I'm calling the police. And that's not the case at all. Yes, we have two police officers in the office taking the tips, but we're not the police. We are, again, like I said, we're governed by a board of directors who are all volunteers and people within our community. They're business owners, they're lawyers, they're regular Joes that wa that take care of our program and make sure it's run properly. People believe, okay, yeah, you guys are Crime Stoppers, you're with the police. Yeah, our office is in the police station. We help police solve crime, but we are not the police. Gotcha. Now, if let's say I wanted to volunteer with uh, Crime Stoppers, uh, how would I go about doing that? What can I expect from any training that you might provide? And uh, once I'm done training, uh, what would I expect to do as my like day-to-day -day task? Well, as a volunteer, we'd ask you to log on to our website, which is catchcrooks.com. There's a volunteer button that you click on, and you're going to watch a quick video answer some questions about Crime Stoppers and how Crime Stoppers works because we want you to be able to volunteer with our program and be able to answer questions because people are going to come up to you as a volunteer with Crime Stoppers and say, and say, well, what's Crime Stoppers all about? And we want you to be equipped with that information to be able to provide the answers. So you're going to watch a video, you need a police records check, and then you'll be off and running. You'll help us out with golf tournaments, we do chuck a -pucks. Uh, we have a wild game dinner. I mean, any type of event that we can raise money, we do bingos. We ask the, these volunteers to help us out with these events. Now, you mentioned the website, catchcrooks.com. Uh, what other ways can the community connect with uh, Windsor Crime Stoppers? Great question. Um, there's two ways you can leave tips with Crime Stoppers. First way, you can call Crime Stoppers at 258-TIPS, 258-8477. Or the way we like it is log on to catchcrooks.com. There's a submit a, uh, submit a tip tab. You just click on the tab and you can submit the information of that crime all on the website. Phenomenal. You can leave a picture and you can communicate with the crime, with the uh, police coordinators. So very successful. Very good. Thank you so much for being here today, Ryan. Jolene, back to you. Thank you, James. Now, I've really been enjoying this warmer weather. Chris, please tell me that it only gets better from here. Well, it's not that hot here. Did you know the hottest recorded temperature was 136 degrees in Libya back in 1922? Well, anyway, back to this week's weather. It looks like Wednesday will experience a high of 8 and a low of 4 with some light rain. Thursday looks like a low of 3 and a high of 10 with some isolated showers. Friday will be partly cloudy and have a high of 13 and a low of 2. That's it for me at the corner of University and Victoria. Back to you, Jolene. Thank you, Chris. In this edition of Comics Crossover, Maureen Mariupula and Mike L. discuss the 75th anniversary of Action Comics number one and this week's recommended reading. Hey, heroes, it's time for Comics Crossover. I'm Maureen Mariupula. And I'm Mike L. Some sad news last week as artist Carmine Infantino passed away at the age of 87. His most important contribution to history was co-creating the Silver Age version of The Flash. He designed Barry Allen's iconic one-piece costume that defined the sleek superhero look of the 1950s and 60s and went on to inspire the costumes for Green Lantern, The Atom, and Spider-Man. Infantino is also famous for rebooting Batman in 1964 with writer John Broome and editor Julius Swartz. They added the yellow circle to Batman's insignia and developed the version of Batman and Robin most familiar to the general public, the street-level crime-fighting Cape Crusaders. He's also responsible for this pinup, perhaps the most famous image of the dynamic duel ever produced. Wasn't last week the 75th anniversary of Action Comics number one the first appearance of Superman? Yes, it was actually. Did you know that while Superman is considered the first superhero, he was heavily based on both the Phantom and Doc Savage? The Phantom was created by Lee Falk in 1936 and was the first fictional character to wear a skin-tight costume, though he did not have any superpowers. Doc Savage was a pulp hero created in 1933 who had no superpowers, but he was considered a perfect human in terms of strength and intelligence. 
His real name was Clark Savage. Uh, his nickname was the Man of Bronze, and he had his own Fortress of Solitude. Cool. So what are you reading this week? This week's recommended reading is Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. Saga tells the story of two lovers, Elena and Marco, who hail from two warring extraterrestrial races. It has been described as Star Wars meets Game of Thrones. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Maureen Mariampala. And I'm Mike L. Girls may not play in the OHL just yet, but reporter Betty Goodall explains how women's hockey is becoming more prominent. Nine-year-old Erica Hanaiti is shooting for the OHL one day. When she's not busy playing for the Tecumseh Tiger Cats, she practices her hockey skills in her backyard rink. She says there is only one reason why girls are not part of the OHL yet. It's just because uh, maybe boys play too violently. Erica says it is her speed and skills that will get her drafted into the OHL one day, not fighting. It is just not part of the game. Her coach, Taylor McLaren, says there has been a distinctive increase with girls playing hockey in the past few years, and some of them are really gifted players. Although girls in the OHL won't become a reality anytime soon, says McLaren, there are some tremendous girls hockey leagues out there. We have a really good uh, women's national team system now that uh, girls can aspire to make. We have, uh, you know, uh, women's teams from every corner of the world now that are traveling around and making women's hockey a big thing. Um, and it, girl, it gives uh, girls a high level to aspire to that's, I think, comparable to the OHL. The good news for girls like Erica is that people are taking women's hockey much more seriously. I'm Betty Goodell reporting for Mediaplex News Now. The UFC is up for discussion in this week's edition of Sports Talk. You're watching Sports Talk. I'm your host Shanika Williams with first time panelists Richard Riosa and Curtis Friesen. So guys, what are your thoughts on the UFC on Fox 7? Um, well, we saw one of the most exciting uh, cards in recent history. Um, we saw nine knockouts. It's very exciting, uh, but ultimately everyone was looking towards the final main event, final fight between Gilbert Melendez and Benson Henderson, the unification title fight for the lightweight championship of the world. Uh, we saw Benson Henderson, you know, kind of get ta it taken to him by Gilbert Melendez in the beginning. Uh, he, Gilbert Melendez took it to him in the first two rounds, but I thought the next three rounds, Benson took over with the leg kicks and um, the Gilberts, he wasn't, wasn't really fighting back uh, as much as he did in the first two rounds. Ultimately winning the split decision, uh, it was a very close fight, very exciting fight, uh, really, really good card. Um, I would agree with the one judge that uh, scored the fight 48-47 for Melendez. Um, I feel like he was really able to push the pace throughout the fight. Um, he got the better of the ex exchanges in rounds one and two, and as you said, momentum started to shift at the end of the second round. Uh, <clears throat> Benson sort of took over the fight, however, I still feel Melendez was able to eke out that decision, winning the fifth round, yeah. and uh, he should be the one bringing the title home. Okay, so what do you predict will happen this weekend coming up in the light heavyweight championship fight? Well, this is the ultimate fighter finale. Um, the coaches, when they're, they're fighting, uh, Chael Sonnen and John Jones, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting matchup because John Jones has that wrestling background. He was a champion in uh, college through high school. And Chael Sonnen, you know what he's going to do. He's going to look for the takedown, look to grind it out. I think the difference will be if he tries to finish John Jones or tries, you know, attempts to finish, he, he, he could come away with the victory, but I think John Jones, he has a, he has a history with fighting wrestlers, um, and he chokes them out, Ryan Bader, whether it be Quentin Rampage Jackson. So I think uh, it could very easily end in a John Jones finish, but we'll see what happens. I think the real question in this fight is whether or not Chael Sonnen can take the fight to the ground. Um, I think when you look at John Jones, he just he has the reach advantage, he has the size advantage, he has the height advantage. Um, I don't think that a smaller man in Chael Sonnen is going to be able to take him down. Um, I think it's going to be John Jones' fight to lose. I feel like he gets the win by submission, probably within the first three rounds. If you look at Chael Sonnen, all of his losses inside the UFC have been by submission. He's pretty prone to tapping out, and I think it's going to happen again. Well, that's all the time we have today on Sports Talk. I'm Shanika Williams. I'm Richard Riosa. Curtis Friesen. Are you looking for a new high-intensity workout? Clay Coyle tells us how an Olympic boxer is giving back to the community. A local Olympic boxer has started an exercise boxing class here in Windsor. Andrew Singh Cooner is a two-time Olympic boxer for Canada. He currently holds the champion title for the Canadian Bantamweight division. 
Kuna started boxing when he was 13, because as a child, he was bullied a lot. Boxing became his passion, keeping him active and healthy. After all of his success in the pro boxing circuit, Kuna wanted to give back. He decided to start his own boxing class. Kuna's class is called BoxFit. It is a cardio boxing class that focuses on high intensity workouts. The class is held at Lifestyles Family Fitness on 13,275 Tecumseh Road East. There are classes Monday to Friday at 7.30 p.m. Kuna said that he loves to interact with his students. Yeah, I like the classes I teach um, here and stuff at this gym. I try to I try to talk to my students and kind of motivate them, things that, you know, when I was growing up and things that were motivating me, I kind of use that, what worked with me, I, I try to make work with them, and it does. All that is required to participate in the box fit class is a membership to Lifestyles. For anyone looking to get fit, Cooner had some words of advice. I always say hard work, dedication, hard work, dedication. The two combined, with that you can persevere in anything you do. For MediaPlex News Now, I'm Clay Coyle. The FlexCore training device was created by Windsorite Paul Mancini. Courtney Turnbull tells us more. A new invention by a Windsorite is on its way to the market. The FlexCore is a resistance training device for athletes that enhances strength and flexibility. Invented by Paul Mancini, the device helps to aid individuals into postures and positions that they would not be able to do on their own. Tested and proved by Dr. David M. Andrews in the University of Windsor Faculty of Human Kinetics, the FlexCore increases motion and improves muscle flexibility. Josh Cameron, a boxer and trainer from Border City Boxing, has used the FlexCore for two years and said it improved him as an athlete. It upped my game. I was better at flexibility better strength, when you, get, when you get better flexibility, you get better coordination, better movement, more explosive power, and um, all of those uh, increased me as an athlete. The benefits of the flex core are, it reduces back strain, maximizes blood flow to the legs and feet, increases range of motion in hips, and gives a full 360 degree rotation without weight obstruction. Cameron said the flex core is already being used by local athletes. The FlexCore is being looked at by a Montreal distributor, and Cameron said he hopes it will be on the market by 2014 to early 2015. From MediaPlex News Now, I'm Courtney Turnbull. This is our last program of the year, and we've enjoyed bringing you stories. So to celebrate our first year being live, we've baked you a cake. It's custom made for the MediaPlex, and if you like what you see, you can head over to Facebook and look at Kay's Cakes in Windsor. So come and join me, everybody. I'm Jolene Bulmer, and this is MediaPlex News Now. <laughs> oh, I want that piece. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a perfect. I can get it out of oh, here. Oh, we it's totally cool. should. Yeah, here. Oh. Right. <laughs>